Bismarck and the Unification of Germany. The Rise of Bismarck, 1851 to 1863. As recounted, the great ideal of a united and liberal Germany for which the Frankfurt Parliament strove had come to nothing within two years. Frederick William of Prussia had refused to accept the leadership of the national movement and without Prussia's leadership, it was lost. By 1851, the supremacy of Austria in Germany was again established. The old powerless confederation of 1815 was revived, and everything seemed to be as before the revolutions. Yet within 20 years, Germans of all historic German states except Austria were united in the new empire of Germany, proclaimed at Versailles in 1871. Such a transformation, such an achievement was the work of one man above all, Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck. Bismarck, one of the most brilliant diplomatics of all time, dwarfed every other politician in Germany called even Lord Pelmeston bluff and outwitted Napoleon III so completely as to make him rather a pathetic figure. By origin, he was a Prussian junker or landed German gentleman whose uh, family had enjoyed the rank of nobility and start shared the local government from the 14th century. He inherited an estate of which he was passionately fond a magnificent set of brains, a tremendous physique, indomitable will power, and the political principles of the tremendous junker class thus were monarchical and highly autocratic, intensely conservative and distrust distrustful to new ideas, especially those of a liberal tendency. It was nevertheless this aristocrat who despised both the ideals of the political capacity of the majority, who succeeded where the liberals of 1848 had failed. Early life. After a conventional university education with much dwelling in beer drinking, he entered the Prussian civil service and shared his year of the army. His civil service career, however, was too monotonous to absorb his relentless energies, which found an additional outlet in gambling and general dissipation. In 1839, he retired from the service to devote himself to his estates, studying the science of agriculture as hard as another maker of destiny, that is Kavar. He rapidly gained a dom do the demonic reputation locally for his vices, his physical energy, his enormous consumption of drink and cigars, and for playing pranks such as awakening guests by firing pistol shots through the windows. But he was too also devouring books of all kinds, making himself the master of many fields of knowledge. With his belief in religion, at Lamb, restored an, a happy marriage to tame his wilderness. By 1848, Bismarck was stable enough to be on the threshold of great achievement. Bismarck in 1848. The liberal revolution of that year found in Bismarck one of its bitterest opponents. As an aristocrat, he disliked any approach to democracy. As a Prussian, he hated the thought of Prussia being merged in Germany. In the Prussian parliament in 1847, to which he was elected, he opposed with all his foes the liberal schemes, speaking against them as stinging and reckless eloquence. He even voted alone with one other member against an address of thanks to the king when the monarchy at length granted a constitution. His attitude was so extreme that Frederick William feared to promote him to office, regarding him as only to be employed when the bayonet reigns. In truth, Bismarck believed that nothing could be done without force. 
He therefore strove to preserve the greatest force available in Germany, the extremely militarist state of Prussia. Though he was not called to office in the critical days of 1848, his advice made its impression on Frederick William. In 1851, when the Prussian monarchy, at the expense of humiliation by Austria and desertion of the national movement, had regained its power in Prussia, Bismarck was appointed a Prussian representative at the revived Confederation Diet. Bismarck at Prussia, representative in the Diet. While he was representing Prussia in the Diet from 1851 to 1858, Bismarck's views underwent considerable development. Up to 1851, his ideas had been purely conservative. Now he became aware of the fact that there were real problems in the weakness of a divided Germany. He began to favor uniting Germany, but not at the price of surrendering the tradition of the power of Prussia. His solution of the German problem became not the liberal one of a free union under a Prussian king stripped of the aristocratic powers but a virtually dictated union under a Prussian king with his power intact. The god of battles, he had already said, will throw the dice that decide. With typical realism, he also recognized that the practical objective of the immediate future was the unification of North Germany, rather than of the whole area covered by the German Confederation. In the same way, Kavar, in extending the territory of Sardinia Piedmont, aimed originally at uniting only the north of Italy. Against this growth of Prussian power, he saw clearly his duties as a representative. Austria will fight with all the weapons of her disposal. She will exploit, uh, I mean, the ascendancy which she had gained over Frederick William to remain the dominant power in Germany. As it was easier to dominate a number of small states than a single great one, and as Austria will not willingly separate herself from her non-German lands, she will block any schemes for German unification which involved the creation of a strong central government. Bismarck, I mean according, according to him, saw in Austria his first enemy. His attitude was soon shown in the famous stories of the cigar and the shirt sleeves. As the diet only, I mean, at the diet only, the Austrian delegate as a special mark of honor ever presumed to smoke, Bismarck as soon as he arrived, lit a cigar. And once, when the Austrian representative received him informally in his shirt sleeves, Bismarck promptly threw off his own jacket with a remark, I agree, it's a very hot day. Before long, he had defeated an attempt by Austria to break up the Zulverein. Such a man will never rest till Austria was disposed from her place of supremacy in Germany. Yet before Austria could be tackled, there were enemies near home to defeat. The liberals of Prussia, by 1858 the reign of the unfortunate Frederick William IV had ended in madness and his younger brother William occupied his throne as regent. King William won by 1861, he was the, I mean by training and temperament, a soldier. He had appointed two keen military minds, both violently anti-liberal at the key positions of the Prussian army. Rune became Minister of War and Amol Clay, Chief of the General Staff. It did not take Rune long to decide, in collaboration with Mouticlay and the king, that the Prussian army must be greatly increased. Together, they planned to raise its strength, including reserves from just under half a million to just over three quarters of a million men. This, with its creation of new regiments, will naturally involve considerable expenditure. Here was the crux of the matter. 
or the liberal majority of the Prussian parliament agree to the military items in the budget? Liberal opposition. It soon became apparent that they would not. The reason for their attitude was not so much that they disapproved of a large Prussian army, as that they strongly disliked two of the proposals that the professional army should have fuller control over the militia or reserve citizen army, and that conscripts of the professional army should serve the full legal three years, instead of the customary two. The liberals also hoped by insisting on their views to assert the control of parliaments over the king of ministers. Sorry, the king and ministers. Obviously, a matter which concerned everybody in two ways. Military training and finance was a suitable issue over which to take up the struggle. The conflict in fact began to run on similar lines to that between Charles I of England and the opponents who at base was the real ruler king of parliament. Meanwhile, the king went ahead and created the new regiments with money from existing taxes, which by a loophole in the constitution he will continue to collect. A parliament overwhelmingly against him threw out the budget prepared by his minister. The situation was becoming perilously near, I mean perilously, near civil war or the surrender and abdication of William. Bismarck, Minister, President of Prussia, 1862. It was at this stage that the king turned to the strong man whose appointment meant no compromise. In 1862, Bismarck, who since 1859 had been out of the way, as Prussia ambassador first at the Petersburg and then at Paris, was summoned to Berlin by a telegraph from Rune. It read, Pecula in mora, de peches verse, that is danger in delay, hurry. This was the sign for which Bismarck had been waiting. Hastening to the capital, he persuaded the king to tear up the document of, I mean, uh, the, of abdication and carry on the struggle to a finish. On the same day, as the budget was again rejected by parliament, Bismarck was appointed minister president. The destiny of Prussia was at last in his hands, and with its destiny not only of Germany but of much of Europe. Bismarck's conception of force. The appointment created the greatest surprise throughout Europe, where statesmen better, I mean, but bettered how long the new minister would last and the greatest uh, consternation throughout Prussia, where it was regarded as a deliberate affront to the liberals. Not one of these was appointed to the new ministry, though there had been several in the old. Hardly anyone realized either the outstanding ability of Bismarck or the growing strength of the state he was to govern. With this army, its devoted civil service, its advanced education system, and its expanding commerce. Bismarck himself seemed to go out of his way to slap the liberals soundly in the face by such remarks as the famous German had its eyes not on the precious liberalism but on its might. The great questions of the day will not be decided by speechless and resolutions of majorities but by blood and iron. The phrase blood and iron ever afterwards stuck to Bismarck. And however much we may or however much we may dislike that fact, the events of the next few years proved that Bismarck's prophecy was completely accurate. He had in fact penetrated to the heart of European politics, that affairs were arranged not by right but by might, and he was determined to accept the logic of this by making Prussia mightier than any possible enemy. 
it was the old policy of Frederick the Great. Bismarck argued that the long run people always thought those who were successful were also right. In any case, the word right held no real meaning for him in international politics, though it had some in private life. So Bismarck believed, not like Kavar, that wrong must sometimes be committed in the interest of the state, but the, that nothing committed sometimes uh, be committed uh, in the interest of the state could be wrong, and particularly if that state was Prussia. In expanding Prussia, he was always able to convince himself that he was carrying out the will of God. Bismarck was later to suffer many sleepless nights from indigestion, but none from a guilty conscience. Anti-liberal measures The first step towards the creation of the great Prussian and German he dreamed of was to crush the liberal opposition to the army reforms. This was done by advising the king to carry on in spite of the rejection of the budget and to collect existing taxes all the same. The press was gapped. Liberals were driven from official positions and Bismarck's unpopularity reached such heights that he could later say to it, men's part on the place where I tried in the suites. But Bismarck had rightly judged that the leading German liberals will shrink and appeal to force the, and, and, and be calculated that everything will be forgiven him when he had achieved something great for Prussia. He deliberately aimed, in other words, at successes in foreign policy in order to win the battle at home. Yet his foreign adventures were always strict and close connected with the main aim Prussia's leadership in Germany, and never like Napoleon III's on the occasion designed largely to palacate opinion at home. Bismarck's Wars, 1863 to 1871. There were three main steps by which Bismarck achieved his desired end. It was marked by a war, in turn against Denmark, against Austria and against France. There has been much debate about how far Bismarck conceived this whole program in advance and how, how far his success came rather than seizing opportunities as they arose. He himself was in no doubt about the matter. He later boasted how he had steered his uh, predetermined course there is no reason to doubt that the broad outline was in his mind from the mid-1860s. Certainly that Austria and France will have to be dealt with if Germany were to be unified under Prussian domination. But the usual steps which led to the wars owed a great deal also to chance, to the seized opportunities of the moment, and to the mistakes of opportunities. Bismarck, though constant in his aim, was always very flexible in his tactics. One mistake he himself never made. It is proof of the brilliance of his statesmanship that in spite of the obviously growing power of Prussia, he succeeded in preventing his enemy from allying with any major power. His first aim in any war, the isolation of the enemy was always achieved. Let us follow the process by which the unification of Germany was accomplished along Bismarck's lines. In 1863, a question which had long troubled Germany nationalists became once more acute. The King of Denmark had, for centuries, ruled over two duchies, that is, Schelleck with Holstein not as the Danish king, but as their duke. I repeat, not as the Danish king, but as their duke. The more northerly duchy, that is the uh, Schelwig, was inhabited by people of Danish origin in the north, but in the south, the majority were Germany speaking. The other duchy, that is Holstein, was largely Germany in character. 
was a member of the Germany Confederation and resented the Danish connection. As the nationalist movement developed in the 19th century, keenly national Danes wanted to absorb the two duchies or at least still a week completely into the Danish kingdom. On the other hand, keenly national Germans wanted to avoid this so that the duchies could later be brought into unity Germany. Already there had been fighting over the matter in 1848 and a dispute over the succession of the duchies, I mean a heir to the Danish throne whose succession to that world come through the female line, a practice I mean, a practice not accepted in the Duchess. In 1852, after Austenberg had resigned his claim in returning for a monetary repayment, a conference of the great power of at London had settled the succession in favor of the King of Denmark. On the bigger question, however, it has simply decided, or rather, it had simply decided that the Duchess should be kept as they were an indivisible part of the lands of the King of Denmark, but not subject to the law of the Danish Kingdom. Unfortunately, they did not satisfy either the Germans or the Danes. By 1863, the intricacies of the situation were such that the Palmerston maintained that only three persons in Europe were completely acquainted with the truth. The Prince Consort, who was dead, a German professor who was in a lunatic asylum, and he himself who had forgotten all about it. In 1863, the Danes came out with a new constitution which linked Stelwig in common arrangements with Denmark, but treated all states separately. At once, a violent protest arose from the Dutchess, which clung to their national or traditional status and from all Germany. The Danes were undoubtedly breaking the London Treaty of 1852 and the eyes of Germans turned to Prussia to see if she were going to act as leader of Germany in the matter. Will she represent Germany's feelings and the Confederation's diet demands and help to install the Prince of I Amin mean, Augenstenberg, that is son of the rejected candidate in 1848 as a ruler of the Duchess? This was Bismarck's first great opportunity. In Holstein, Augenstenberg was now claiming to be Duke and the Confederation diet voted to send its troops to support him. Bismarck wanted neither to break the Treaty of London nor to himself to hold himself too firmly to Austenberg, so it was Saxon, I mean, and Hanoverian troops, not Prussians, who marched into Holstein on behalf of the Confederation. How could Bismarck now maneuver the situation so that Prussia will take over the lead on behalf of Germany, but finish up in a possession of the Duchess? A glance at a map shows that Stelwig and Holstein with each spot of clay were the immense strategical importance of Prussia, particularly since Stelwig could be used as a base of a naval operation against her. No one as yet, however, saw that Bismarck's policy of annexation for the simple reason that Prussia had no more right to the duchies than the China or Japan Europe had not yet realized that the realm or the real attitude of Prussia was represented by Rune, who remarked that the question of the Duchess was not on the right or law but of force and that Prussia had it. Prussia and Austria fight Denmark in 1864. Bismarck's handling of the question was consummately skillful. He first secured the friendship of Russia and Tsar by supporting the Tsar in every opportunity way short of war during the Polish rebellion of 1863. Then he concluded an alliance with Austria, the time of which where the two powers will intervene unless Denmark withdrew the new constitution and that the future of the Duchess should be settled by joint agreement between Prussia and Prussia and Austria. This made the confederation powerless in the matter. 
having thus ensured that the balance of local force will be on his own side, Bismarck then demanded that Denmark will submit the whole matter to a European Congress. Encouraged by Britain, Denmark refused and the Austrian and Prussian armies promptly invaded Schilwig. Bismarck had, I mean, seen the Fran that France and Britain were not on good enough terms to cooperate in stopping the invasion, had encouraged Napoleon to abstain by hints of future compensation for, uh, for France in the Rhineland and had called Palmerston bluff that if Denmark had to fight, she will not fight alone. Britain, hastily backing down, was humiliated before all Europe. And after the Danes had been beaten by duly surrendering their right in the two duchies to Austria and Prussia. The affair at this stage, however, was far from ended. Public opinion in Germany and the duchies expected that Austenberg will now be installed as Duke in uh, both territories. Bismarck, however, proposed that he should be installed on condition which will have left him completely under the power of the Prussia. Eventually, after they had quarreled violently over their joint administration, it was agreed by the two powers, though not by the unfortunate Austenberg, who now faded out of history that for the time being Austria should administer Holstein and Prussia's Schelwig. The Convention of Gainstein, as this agreement is called simply in Bismarck's phrase, papered over the cracks. He knew that he could now at any time pick a quarrel with Austria over the government of Holstein, and he was confident that the Prussian army could smash the Austrians at heat at smash the Danes. Thus he could finish up with the host in the North Germany under Prussian control and Austria forever driven from her dominant position in Germany. It was subtle and immortal and immoral state I mean it was subtle and immoral statementship for it appeared to certain essential persons with more delicate consciences than himself. Such as King William, Austria must first be put in the wrong. At these finer aspects of the diplomatic game, Bismarck was a past master. He secures R. France's neutrality. In preparation for the war against Austria, he had now decided on Bismarck, took two important steps. Again, he secured the neutrality of Napoleon III by talk of future compensation. Prussia, his representative hinted, will not take offense if ever Napoleon should think of acquiring Belgium, and there was always the possibility of ceding to France Germany territory along the left bank of the Rhine. Napoleon, for his part, welcomed the prospect of an Austro-Prussian conflict for another reason. He imagined that it could exhaust both combatants and that he could step in at later stage to reap big advantages. He was actually with Napoleon's blessings that Bismarck's, as his next step concluded an alliance with the new kingdom of Italy at, I mean, to attack Austria in the rear if war should come within their months. Italy, reward, was to be Venetia. All that then there remained was to make certain the war came with a, within the stipulated time. Failing to provoke Austria by sending Prussia forces into Holstenburg to expel the Confederation troops, Bismarck's proposed a reform of the confederation by which Austria will be entirely committed from Germany affairs. In an effort to win the German liberals and nationalists to his side against Austria, he even asked that the new German parliament to replace the uh, confederation diet should be I mean, elected by universal suffrage. Austria naturally objected to this proposal and moved to the members of the confederation should jointly attack the insolent Prussia. 
Nine of the German states agreed, including all the larger ones, while six took the Prussian side. Prussia thereupon left the Confederation and declared it dissolved. The war had come, and Bismarck had managed to convince William and the Prussians that it was purely defensive. The Seven Weeks War, 1866 The cause of the Seven Weeks War, as it is called, astonished Europe. Against the hostile states in the north and center, including Hanover, the Prussian army had little more to do than to walk in and take possession, while against Austria and Saxony, everything was settled in one overwhelming victory at Konigratz in Bohemia. Even the fact that the Austrians were entirely successful against the Italians could not alter the result in the main seat of the war. Prussian training and tactics. The breech loading needle gun and the well planned movement of troops by railway had done their work. Everything over before Napoleon could reap any advantage from it. When he frantically tried to reclaim Rhineland territory as compensation, Bismarck encouraged France to put her demands in writing and then turn them down flat. It is France that is beaten at Sadoa, he said, or rather said the yes. The wisdom of Bismarck's statementship is nowhere seen more fully than in the conditions he imposed after he seized the decisive Prussian victory. The first point was the rapidity with which he ended hostilities to rob France of any chances of it to intervene. The king and the army were anxious to march in triumph to Vienna and punish Austria by annexing Austria, I mean, by annexing Austrians Silesia or some other territory. I mean, Bismarck instead demanded a halt. His object, I mean, his object was not to make Austria a permanent enemy, but simply to expel her from Germany's leadership so that the field there was clear for Prussia. He insisted, insisted that not a yard of Austrian territory should be annexed by Prussia, and that the only law suffered by Austrians should be Venetia, which he had promised to Italy. Reluctantly, King William agreed, and this arrangement formed part of the final treaty at Prague. Outside Austria, however, Prussia annexed Holstein, Hanover, Nassau, Hesse, Cassili, and the free city of Frankfurt. She also retained Schelwig. These gains gave her an extra four and a half million inhabitants, a very impact territory running across North Germany and an important outlet to the North Sea. The main blow to Austria, however, was that by the Treaty of Prague she also had to recognize the abolition of the old confederation and the settlement and the, I mean, the setting up of a new body in its place, the North German Confederation, from which she was excluded. The object of this was to ensure the supremacy of Prussia. Most of the defeated German states were compelled to enter the new organization, including the Kingdom of Saxony. The main South Germany territories, however, notably Bravia, Baden, and uh, Württemberg, had to be left outside owing the strong local feeling and the attitude of Napoleon III, who was prepared to stand aside only if the new Prussian dominated confederation extended only as far south as the rich main. The King of Prussia was the President of Bismarck, the counselor of the new organization. Home affairs were left almost entirely to the individual states, but the matter of foreign policy were placed in Prussia's hand by the stipulation that Prussia controlled the army of all members. A concession to democracy was made by allowing all men a vote for the parliament of a righteous tag, though that as had made by allowing all men a vote for the parliament of Reichsenberg, made a councillor was responsible for the king and not the Reichsberg. 
this concession was more apparent than real. The feelings of individual states too were solaced. I mean the feeling of the individual states too were solaced by setting up a federated council or Brunestag consisting of the representatives in which it was possible for all combined out outro vote Prussia. This meant that the annexed northern German states, while definitely acknowledging the supremacy of Prussia, did not lose all the liberty of action and prestige they would have surrendered by definitive exaction and thus their relations with Prussia were not unfriendly in spite of defeating the war. Further, Bismarck's and condition of peace had insisted that the South German states should sign a military alliance with Prussia and had made them willing to do so by revealing to them Napoleon's plans for expansion at their expense. He induced them also to link up with the Northern Confederation in a new custom parliament elected by universal suffrage which replaced the old Zolvere. Thus, by the arrangements following the war, Bismarck achieved the remarkable feat of expelling Austria from her old leadership and uniting most of Germany under Prussia without making permanent enemies of any of his victims. This leniency was absolutely essential to Bismarck's policy. He knew only too well that the day of reckoning had to come with Napoleon III and when he did, it was important to have Austria and South Germany as friends rather than foes. Like a good chess player, Bismarck thought several moves ahead. Austrian Reorganization The Seven Weeks War, greatly as it benefited, victorious Prussia was not without advantage for defeating Austria. Driven out of Germany and Italy, she at last reorganized as a uh, real mission as an empire centered on the Danube. Realizing that if reorganization was to be successful, something must be done to satisfy racial reorganization feeling within the empire. Austria decided on a large measure of compromise with her biggest non-German territory, Hungary. This agreement of 1867, known as the Auslige, that is the compromise, divided the Austrian Empire into two halves. Austria, which included Bohemia and the northern provinces, and Hungary, which covered also the South Slav states of Transylvania. Each section reorganized. Francis Joseph as emperor but preserved it its independent parliament for most matters. Three subjects, however, foreign affairs, defense, and finance for these were to come under a jointly body representative of the two divisions and meeting alternately in Vienna and Budapest. Thus the Austrian Empire was reorganized as a dual monarchy or Austrian-Hungary under which name it continued to be known until it broke up into its various racial fragments at the end of the First World War. For Bismarck, there remained one more stage in the unification of Germany under Prussia. Austria had been displaced from her supremacy and the North German Confederation formed. In Prussia itself, the old opposition of the liberals, dazzled by his success, had died down and he had been forgiven everything. The more nationalistically minded among the liberals even broke off from the radicals to form a separate national liberal party and became Bismarck's main supporters. Yet the main South German states, that is the Bavaria, Utamberg and Baden, although now bound by military and economic alliance, still remained outside. Bavaria especially clung to her independence and her local peculiarities. I mean, Bismarck, however, held all the triumph cards. He knew that France was unlikely to, be al to allow Prussia to gain control over such Germany peacefully. He also knew that it was between 
Prussia and France. If war between Prussia and France broke out, they saw the German states uncomfortably situated between the two combatants could remain neutral. As Germans and as military allies of Prussia, they must oppose France. Once let them fight side by side with Prussia against the history enemy, on let Prussia take control of the emergency of war, and Bismarck knew that the Prussian hold will not be lightly shaken off again. Accordingly, he deliberately willed and prepared for war with France to complete the unification of Germany along the lines he desired, a unification which will spring not from free bargaining as a much later unification might have done, but from Prussia power. The fact, however, must not blind us to the equal truth that France, on a side, gave Prussia every provocation Bismarck desired. Ever since Adoa, terribly alarmed at the growth of a new power on her eastern boundary, France had determined to stem the tide of German unity, ill-feeling grew when Napoleon III, I mean this, that ill-feeling grew when Napoleon III, desperately hoping to secure his throne by success in foreign policy, tried to buy the Grand Duchy and Luxembourg from the King of Netherlands. This move, which Bismarck himself had promised to accept to keep his opinions open with Napoleon and to which the Dutch king agreed, was thwarted by an outcry in Germany. Luxembourg had been a member of the old German confederation and Prussian troops were still garrisoning the fortress town of Luxembourg itself. Bismarck promptly fell in with the mood in Germany and warned Napoleon off. A conference of the powers then decided in the neutralization of Luxembourg as a separate state. The Prussian garrison was withdrawn, but the King of Holland continued to be the Grand Duke, a bitter blow to the French Empire. Bulked off lands on, on the Rhine in 1866 and Luxembourg in 1867, humiliated in Mexico and in a contradictory position in Italy, Napoleon could not now risk another chance to dethrone him. Sorun and Moltke prepared the Prussian armies and Bismarck laid his diplomatic plans. Secure in the knowledge that all the right moment France could be maneuvered into threatening war. The South German states would then fight glad, I mean gladly side by side with Prussia to protect Germany from the danger and Bismarck will know how to use the opportunity. Like Cromwell, he believed that it was a good thing to strike while the iron was hot, but a better thing to make the iron hot by striking. Hohenzollern candidature in Spain. The opportunity came in 1870, the throne of Spain vacant. A Hoben Z. Holland, a relative of Williams, whose was encouraged by Bismarck to stand as a candidate. Bismarck knew perfectly well that France, already frightened at the growth of Prussian to the east, would not accept a German on the throne of Spain to the south. William and the prince concerned knew that these two was not wishing to cause a European outcry, were unwilling to advance their Hohenzollern candidature. Bismarck, however, overrode them both and almost compelled the prince to go forward. The announcement of the news caused the reaction in France that Bismarck had expected. Intense indignation and a demand that the candidature should be withdrawn. Acting now on his real inclinations, William advised the candidate to retire. Such advice from the head of the royal house was equivalent to a command. And France had won a striking success, unfortunately. France had experience of Bismarck's double dealing and was suspicious that the prince's son might become the candidate instead. She was too anxious of an even more resounding diplomatic triumph than she had just achieved. Consequently, the French decided also to seek an apology. 
and, and and a taking from William that the Hollands or land candidature will never in any case or circumstance be renewed. This demand William brushed aside as a reflection of his good faith and an attempt to pick a quarrel. How Bismarck, who had thought his chance was slipping from his hands, saved the opportunity by editing the king's decision from Elms to read more provocatively has already been told in an account on the Second Empire in the face of the fury of Francis Bismarck persuaded William to order the mobilization of the Prussian army. In fact, or in the face of the mobilization of the Prussian army, France declared war. The Franco-Prussian War in 1872-1871 the Franco-Prussian War, as we have seen, astonished Europe by the ease with which the much vaunted military prowess crumpled before the ruthless, I mean, crumpled before the ruthless efficiency of the Prussian troops. Straba, Sedan, Metz, France was at Prussia's feet. By the organization of the Prussian armies, the work of Rune, Moltke and the king would have been in vain had not Bismarck first secured the requisite political decisions. The secret of it was that France had been isolated from all possible help. Italy was no more than half a friend while France occupied Rome and had recently fought as an ally of Prussia. Russia was bribed not to interfere but by the suggestion that she should repudiate the clauses of the 1856 treaty restricting her right to warships on the Black Sea. Britain was alienated by Bismarck's publication at the critical moment of the French proposal of 1866 to annex Belgium. Russia and the South German states had been partly reconciled by the lenient treaty after the um, seven weeks war and the southern German states were bound in military alliance to Prussia. France had no friend in Europe and left alone in a state of intense desertion to face the Prussian army she was powerless. It was Bismarck's master stroke. Germany Empire created in 1871. Already before the war was over and the Treaty of Frankfurt signed by which Prussia was to strip France of Alsace, most of Lorraine and the indemnity, Bismarck's main object was achieved. In the flash of enthusiasm for the common cause, the South German states were ready after due negotiation to unite with the North German Confederation into a German Empire. Special concessions were given to Bravia in the way of independence and a special secret payment to the Bravian King Ludwig II and Alugui then undertook to invite William in the name of princes to accept the imperial crown of the new Germany. It was only by such an invitation that the Prussian king was designed to assume his new position. So on 18th January, 1871, in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, the, the German Empire was solemnly proclaimed with William as the first German Emperor or Kaiser. The setting was appropriate. Versailles stood more than anything else for the historic aggressive glory of France. Now in Versailles, while Paris lay starving ten miles away, a triumphant Germany rose by and threw out the humiliation of the most brilliant civilization in Europe. But empires, even when they are the works of Bismarck, are not solemn built on shifting suns. Overbearing Germany and heartbroken France could now know that before 50 years were out, the Hall of Mirrors will reflect another scene of equal importance with the roles of victor and vanquished reversed.